So, guten Tag. Wie geht's? Wie geht's? So, wer spricht Deutsch? That's quite many. Uh, I can't actually fake a presentation in, in German, so I, I was hoping for fewer hands. Um, anyway, uh, what I'll be talking about here today is about, well, where JavaScript comes from and uh, how it works generally and uh, how you can use it for pretty interesting stuff. And what I won't be covering is poor implementations in browsers or the DOM or anything other that's just annoying. So I'll just talk about nice things. And in the beginning, we basically, as a web developer, had nothing when we were developing web pages. Uh, it was only stale gray web pages and, and if we were really fancy, we had some kind of line going down there in the middle to separate content and, and that was it. And then this wonderful man came along by the name of Brendan Eich and Brendan had a vision to, to make, well, the content a bit more alive on the web. And the way I see Brendan, to, to me, Brendan is Yoda. Bre Brendan is the, the master that hopefully, I don't know, but hopefully lives somewhere out in the woods and just telling how, how the force should work. So what is JavaScript, really? It, it's something that Brendan came up with in 1995. And at the end of 1995, in uh, beta of Netscape 2, uh, the first version of JavaScript saw, saw a life. And, uh, well, first it was called Mocha, then LiveScript, but eventually got the name JavaScript. And uh, I think in August or September of 1996, Microsoft had reverse engineered JavaScript and turned it into JScript. And where we see JavaScript today is pretty much everywhere on the web. Like, you know, it could be counting characters or a small reply, whatever. Uh, I just like this image because it seems very cute at first, but then if you look at it, it seems like something you would pay extra for in Bangkok, or Berlin for that matter. And we also have it in, in more interesting applications like, well, Gmail. I think Gmail is probably the biggest one that have just shown the power of JavaScript and to have true applications on the web. So when I was doing my, my research before this talk, I, you know, just for fun, I searched for JavaScript. And the first hit on Google is Java, which is a bit depressing after, well, 14 years or something, or 13. And um, the, the problem is there that JavaScript doesn't really have anything to do with Java. Um, Syntax-wise, sure, I mean, we have the curly braces, semicolons, and that, and that's pretty much it. So we're trying to get rid of that and, and just move on. So, And where we are today is, on, I think it's just exploded in the last few years that JavaScript has become one of the world's mo most popular programming languages. And uh, with web browser, we have an interpreter on, on every machine that can just run JavaScript and, and pretty much everywhere now in, in our cell phones and devices and all that. There's also some standardization, standardization going on with ECMAScript, which is a work in progress right now. But what's good about it is that it's being realistic. So it's based on what works now and, and kind of build on top of that, exactly like with HTML5. L look at what works in browsers now and build on it instead of having some, something that would be perfect in theory but would take about 20 years to implement in practice. Also, what's very exciting for me is that I can write the same code and it just gets faster and faster because web browsers have sort of a little JavaScript engine war going on with Safari and, and Google and, and Firefox and, and Opera is doing a good bit there too. Uh, well, as we all know, one of them is a bit slow otherwise, but at least I have some indication that Microsoft are, are really trying about improving performance and, and taking some really interesting measures to, to make it better as well. I just hope they live up to it. Another person that I have to mention when we talk about JavaScript is if Brendan Eich is the, the godfather or the Yoda of JavaScript, Douglas Crockford has come up with lots of interesting techniques and ideas 
how to use it and how to implement better and, and better practices and, and how to find the good parts in JavaScript. So if, uh, if Ben is, oh sorry, uh, Douglas is Ben, Obi-Wan Kenobi for me. And uh, some of the things, I, I won't really go into detail with them, but he, he's behind Jason, or, or as he humbly would say himself, that he only wrote the spec, but the, the approach was already there. He's also behind JS Lint for validating JavaScript syntax and, and find out the best way to write JavaScript to avoid problems and to work together in teams and, and similar. And also something like JS Min for just minifying JavaScript files so they don't weigh as much kilobyte wise so it gets faster to load them in a web page. So usually when I give presentations, I would like to have a theme. So the theme today is going to be Ben Affleck. And the, the code will pretty much cover Ben in his life, I would say. So if you start, start off very easy. Uh, how many here think, okay, this sounds offensive, but how many here think they know JavaScript? Okay, so. That was just scary. I think everyone here actually knows JavaScript. Uh, so I'll go pretty fast here in the beginning, and, and I'll kind of slow down. And if it, it goes weird, just wave or, well, leave. The, the basic of JavaScript is, well, as basic as it gets. We can just define a variable. That's it. We just have the var keyword, a name for it, and it equals a value. And the same goes for functions. That's pretty much it. We have a function, we have a name, and just the content of the function. I know, well worth the money so far. I'm probably learning a lot right now. But we're, when it starts to get interesting is when we talk about conditionals, and we have four types of conditionals in JavaScript. We have if statements, switch statements, but we also have shortened assignments and, and ternary operators, and then they're pretty close to each other. And shortened assignments, is basically for us cool developers that want to do one-liners that are actually readable as well. Is, as you see here, if we send in the parameter with Liv Tyler, if that is equals true, and the value will be true for the variable nice here, we just have the or in the middle, so it goes to false. You can just assign something in one line. It's pretty close to the ternary operators, which is just a, a small, if case, basically. So you have within the parenthesis, you have a, a value to check, <coughs> sorry. And if it equals true, that value comes through, otherwise the other things happen. And as with any other language, we have the one equal sign to assign a value, a regular assignment, and two equal signs is to check equality. But JavaScript also has this funky syntax with three equal signs, which usually mess people up, and, and the reaction is usually, I haven't seen this anywhere else, you know, screw it, I'll use the, the two. But it actually makes a difference in practice. And, uh, you know, one is just assignment, as you see here. But the thing here was with equality, with two equal signs, is that the number five equals the string five. And that's because JavaScript is trying to be nice and, and kind of figure out what you actually meant and then compare the values. So to cover up for something like that, instead you want to use three equal signs. Because the three equal signs will not only compare the value, it will also compare the type of what you're comparing. So both of them have to be a number or a string to be true. And as with any language, uh, JavaScript is, is based on short circuit logic, which means that you don't, and I see it all the time when I work as a consultant, that people have nest about 15 if clauses and, and it's 400 lines of code. You don't need to do that. It, you just evaluate the first value, and if it doesn't become true, uh, it won't go on in, in or and ands and, and similar. So as you see in the last line here, you can just check if the object actually exists first. And if true, it goes on, you can check the property without throwing an error. Otherwise, it'd just be false. And what I was talking about here with the double and, and triple equal signs is something referenced as type coercion. And what type coercion does is, is the magic of 
trying to help you, but just messing things up for you, basically, which is one of the poor parts of JavaScript. And as you saw, five, the number equals five the string. And also if you try to add a string together with numbers, uh, it will become a string, because the string will win in that case. So to cover up for something like that, if you know that the values might be of different types, you, you don't really want to rely on JavaScript and just you know, hope it goes well. So instead you can use the parseInt method if you actually want a number and complement it with equal signs and such. Another thing that, uh, well, it's still a bit scary to me actually, and that is that a number of different values all equal false or something at least close to false if I'm trying to check them with if or something similar. So null, undefined, zero, false, actually an empty string as well. An empty string is the same as the boolean false if I try to check the value of it. So all of this code, all these different values, when I'm checking them, will not go through and they will stop the execution. And in JavaScript, we have basically five different data types. We have strings, numbers, booleans. We have the interesting value undefined. But beside that, everything else is an object. The object is the mother of everything in, in JavaScript. And different types of objects are functions, arrays, date object, regex, etc. And to complement that, like we had an empty string that would equal false, you usually want to check the type of instead to see the actual, well, type that gets sent in and if it's of the right type and then you can check the value. And it just complements the, the different object types in JavaScript. We have strings, numbers, boolean, etc. So if you look at that in code, if a variable that doesn't have a value yet, it will be undefined. A string will naturally be a string, a number will be a number. And, and also a, a function will also be a function. I think this is probably good advice as well to always have a number one go-to guy if you have a dead hooker in your hotel room. But we kind of get tricked is if you have a JavaScript object, just an empty curly braces here, uh, you check type of, that will be an object. But if you check type of for an array, it will also say object, which is a bit scary because then you have no idea. It doesn't really help. It is more like the null is null error messages in, in Internet Explorer. So what you can do is use something called instance of to complement type of. And there you can check if it's an instance of an actual core object in JavaScript. So you have a variable and you have the object and that's not an instance of an array, but the array is an instance of the mother array that exists. <coughs> and there are also a, a number of different types of functions. You have the regular procedural functions, which is just a function. We can also assign functions directly to a variable and then just use that variable name as the new name of the function. We can have anonymous function for those that don't even deserve a name. We're just going to use them for a short amount of time or just write a little code. So we just give them to event or another value and, and that's pretty much it. But where it gets a bit interesting is where you have the self-invoking functions that we just call themselves right away. So as we see here, uh, we have a couple of apple, sorry, a couple of parentheses at the end which makes the function run right away. And when I talk to people that they work with C++ or Java or similar, uh, and they work with method overloading and different versions of, of doing something, um, that doesn't really exist in JavaScript. Um, so if you have a function, you can actually just omit any argument you want, or you can add some more that the function doesn't actually expect as well. And what we have instead of overloading is the arguments collection in JavaScript. So if we have a regular function here, uh, and it's expecting three values in, the A, B, C, the first one will work because it gets the three values it wants, but the last one will just return a none, which means not a number. 
And to cover up for that, we have the arguments collection that you can iterate over. Uh, and I just want to point out that it's not an actual array, it's a collection. So you can loop through all these values, but you can't use array methods like push or concat or similar. So instead, if we had the concat function here, what we can do is that within every function in JavaScript, you don't need to declare it at all. You have something called arguments, and that will be all the parameters that get sent in, no matter if it's 1, 15, or 500. Well, I haven't actually maxed it out, but at least what I think. Uh, and then you can send in any values and, and kind of use this approach instead, and within the function, do your overloading instead of having different sets of the same function. And if you want to construct objects in, in JavaScript, the good old way that you see it in, in every, well, proper language, as some people see it, um, you have a ban object here, and you use the this keyword to assign properties to it. This.name is, is ban, and got an Oscar, etc. And at the bottom here, I just create an instance of that object, and then I check the value of a property of that instance. But if you're one of the cool kids, that, that syntax isn't that really the, the one that goes. You want to use the object literal instead, where the idea is, is well, just a shorter syntax, basically, that you have the curly braces instead. Uh, and we should note also in here that you don't have the equal signs for assigning properties. You have the colon. And you don't have a semicolon at the end of each line. Each line. Uh, you just have the, the comma sign. But you don't have it after the last one. But if you want to work with that object, um, it's the same way. You just have the instance name and check a property on it. And as with any code everywhere, there are also different schools, how you want to assign a value or, or read a value. Uh, personally, I, I prefer the dot notation, the band dot arms here. But what's pretty good about the other one here is that you can have a dynamic value sent in. So instead of having lots of lots of lines checking different properties in a function, um, you can just send in a variable here instead of arms. And first I can check the arms and legs, etc., in there and just have one line of code for it. What's also a bit funny about JavaScript is that you can extend or change anything about JavaScript, and you can change anything about core JavaScript when you run it in a web browser and just override how JavaScript thought it would work. So if I have an object here, I can have an integer as the property name, like 1972, or a string, or I can actually have a Boolean as a property on an object. And I can also do this to the native objects in JavaScript, like with the string object or the um, array object or regex object, and you know, just for fun, I can have a number here that has a new value, and, and maybe this just seems like a geeky thing. So yeah, I can break something or, or make something weird, but where it becomes very useful is that if you have different web browsers without dropping any names, uh, some of them aren't as competent as others. So if they have something faulty or not good enough in their JavaScript implementation, I can override it myself. So we, we had, uh, in, in a web browser that was around for quite a long time, it didn't support the push method on array objects. So instead, I can just write the code and actually implement the push method on my own. Then I can use the push method in all my code and just kind of fix JavaScript in the web browser. So total freedom. And when we have an object here to check values, it, it's not like an array that can iterate over. So instead, you can just use a for loop that goes through each item in that object and just reads out the name of that property and the value of that property. And as we saw before with the empty string or undefined or similar that just equals false, uh, if you want to be sure that that doesn't happen, you can instead use the syntax here to check if year, where year is the name of the property in the good movie object, exists. And it could be an empty string then, and this if clause would still equal true. 
So it's just a way to make sure that the router is there and not just checking its value. In JavaScript, we, there's something called uh, prototype-based inheritance instead of class-based, uh, as we have in well, virtually any other language out there. And the interesting thing about prototype, it just checks its instance and just works its way out through everything it has inherited so far. So if we start by creating a simple object here, the, the super object, if you will, called being, and it has a property, and you just use the prototype syntax as the being.prototype to assign a method to all instances of the being object that will just return the value hello. So if you remember this, please, we create the ban object here. And then we say that the ban object is a prototype of the being object. That means that the ban object here will have everything that the being object has and more. And you can override anything that has been inherited from the being object if you want to as well. And it also has a, a method here just to say something. So if we create an instance of the ban object, and you always create an instance by using the new keyword. Uh, and then you run the method on the ban object, and we'll just return the, the value I feel like fame is wasted on me. That's all fine. But then if you run the greet method, the greet method doesn't actually exist on the ban object. It came from the being object. So the way JavaScript works is that it first check the ban instance, like do, does this specific instance have a greet method? No, okay. Does the prototype for all, sorry, for all ban objects have it? No. So it goes up to the being prototype. Oh, right, there's the greet method. Fine, let's just execute it then. And if the being object wouldn't have it either, it goes up to the object because, as I said before, object is on the top of it all. Everything goes up to object. There are a number of people, way smarter than I am, that have tried to implement it, well, syntax for using class-based inheritance in JavaScript. So you can write code the same way uh, and just make sure to, to cover up for where JavaScript doesn't actually work that way. Uh, I think um, the, the first example here is done by John Resig, uh, who's actually here somewhere. Um, and the other one is by Dean Edwards, who's a JavaScript god. And the last one is from the prototype JavaScript library. And why I included this is if you understand the code in the pages that I link to here, you know everything you will ever need to know about JavaScript. Then, then you're all set, then you can retire because there's nothing more to learn. But it's interesting to look at and, and take their code and mess it up and kind of see how JavaScript behaves as well. But I would like to argue for using the prototype syntax that exists in JavaScript, because even if the other solutions by the other people are very smart, it's not really native to JavaScript, and it's not the way JavaScript actually works. And if you use the prototype syntax, uh, anyone that knows JavaScript will understand your code right away without some special code that you wrote and just to cover up for it. And especially for me, what I see, in, in different projects, like a developer works on something for about six months and then he gets thrown into another project and a new developer comes in and the new developer has to learn their own developer's special methods to fix things and it doesn't really work. And, uh, well, the godfather of JavaScript, Douglas Crockford, uh, has also written code to do this uh, and his conclusion is basically that, well, you can use a super function or uber function, if you will, and, and call that, but you don't really need it. That's not really how you usually use JavaScript. Uh, I actually asked him about three days ago if he still stood by the statement, and he seemed to nod, so this still goes. <coughs> and something that's very good to know in JavaScript is scope. Like, where do you have access to something and, and why? And how do you override things? And how can your code collide with other parts of your code? And basically what, what scope is, is where 
variables and functions are accessible and what context we are in right now. And it, it, it's pretty easy in JavaScript. We have a global scope, which is pretty much everywhere, or we have a local scope in the function you're in. So if you have, in a JavaScript file, we just have a variable that's just lying there that likes to play, it's accessible everywhere. And within a function, you use the var likes to play, that makes it local. And a very, very common problem in JavaScript is people forgetting to use the var keyword within a function. And if you forget the var keyword in a function, it automatically becomes global, which is messy because people miss it and they overwrite something else and you have a problem. And also if you come from other languages, you're used to something called block scope. Like you could have an if clause here and just have something that's only available in that context. But that's not really, not really how JavaScript works. In JavaScript, you can have an, an if clause here and just decline, uh, sorry, declare the variable within there. Uh, but you can still access it anywhere outside of it, of that clause. Anywhere within the function, you can access a variable decla declared within the function. And the same goes for function, it's global, you can access it anywhere. But then we can, you know, take a step forward and just start nesting functions. And uh, that's when it becomes a bit interesting because then you can run things within a certain context that's not available anywhere else. So the inner function, you can only run it or access it from within the outer function here. And I, I see a lot of people trying to use the this keyword in JavaScript, like this dot something. Uh, and they don't really know why this is a certain value or, or how to control that value. So what you can do with a function is they can use the call or the apply method on a function uh, to set the actual context for that function. And it's just built in for every function. You don't need to declare it anywhere. And if you generally in a web browser, if you have a function here and you have the onload event on the window, it calls the function that this keyword here equals the window object because it's the global object in a web browser. But say you want it to be something else. Then we can have the onClick event here and you have the setName function. And as you see at, at the bottom here, it uses dot call, which means that it will call the setName function in the context I want it to be. So the first parameter here is document. It could be anything I want. Uh, and what I set as the first parameter here will be the this keyword in the receiving function. And if I had a number of parameters up there, like you see the name parameter, that will not be the document name. So if you use the call method, the first one only sets context. It's not the first parameter to the receiving function. And the apply method is pretty much the same. With the call method, you just send in a comma separated thing with different values. The apply method is where you send in an array or a collection instead. So what you can use here, we were talking about arguments before, that in the call set names function here, we can just take all the arguments set into that function and just pass them on to the other function and use apply to run it in the context of the document object. And then we have closures and closures are the best thing in the world. And, and just to get the right state of mind when you think about closure is, I, I want you to go to your happy place. You know, just back down and, and, and feel nice about it. What, what makes you happy? What makes you relax? What makes you, what makes you feel good? <laughs> and when you are in that state, you're pretty much ready to, to grasp closures. And what closures are, it's expressions uh, that you use to create your own context and where you can access certain values in a context that you control. And as we saw before with inner functions nested in outer functions, the inner functions can always reference something in the containing function, which is just a, a bunch of words I'm saying. So 
let's see some code for it. And uh, now it's what's fun presenting when people just start gaping. But the, the thing here is that we have the var add five variable here, which equals a call to the add method with the value of five. As you see in the add method, it returns a function where it applies an outer value with an inner value, and then I can use it, the result of that call, in another function, uh, which is usually I explain it, and we're pretty much here in our relationship. So, if you break it down here, you send in the x value the first time the add function is being called. And as we said, the inner functions can always reference values of its containing function. So it will remember the value of x at the time it was being called, and it will always, always remember that. So the way JavaScript actually sees the add5 function that we declare with the variable here is like the bottom here. Like it remembers the value 5 forever because it was 5 the time it was called. And then it just applies the new values. You can take this code and mess around with it and then it will make some more sense, I hope. Um, and to have a more real uh, live context for it, and I actually got this question last night because a person had this problem, uh, which made me very happy because it, it should imply that this example is good. And is that, that people usually have well, a loop in a web page, and they just, like here, you create five link elements. Uh, you will give them a value, like link zero, link one, etc. And you also apply an on-click event to it. And you want, when the link is being clicked, that it should say its number. You know, the first one should be zero, the next one should be one, etc. But what happens with this code is that every link you click in the web page will say five which makes people go a bit crazy because that's not really what they thought it would be. And the reason here is that the function here that's applied to the onclick event is not actually called when you apply it to the link. And, and, and that's the key reason here. Like we said before, it would just remember the value of its outer function. So it will remember the value of, of i when the function is finished. So what you would want to do instead is where you have the onclick event here is that you apply it to what we talked about before, a self-invoking function that sends in the value of i at that moment in time, at that specific iteration. So as we see here, it link.onclick equals function blah, 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 but it also calls itself right away at the end with the value of i. And the value of i is sent in as the parameter num, and then it returns a function that remembers the value of num. And that's what, what creating closures is all about. It, it just sends in that value, and the inner function will always remember the value of this outer function just when it happened, not when you click it or, or five years later, just that moment in time. And to take use of all this code, it's, we have something nicknamed the Yahoo JavaScript module pattern. And again, Mr. Crawford. And it's a singleton pattern to create an object and to, in JavaScript, even though it's not supported, you can have private members and public members of an object. So I should mention first, just to be fair to Ben, this is actually a good movie. I was a bit scared when I saw it start and I saw it directed by Ben Affleck and, you know, Damn, but it was actually good. Anyway, uh, what you do here is we were talking about the thing of having functions calling themselves right away to create the closure, i.e. a context where you can just access whatever you want but not from the outside. So what we have here is just a regular function, but you see down here that it calls itself right away. And it also has a return statement here and what you have in the return statement is what will be global as a result from this. So in practice then, everything you have declared above, like the, the var keyword for the movie title and the is directed by Ben variables, 
that will, will only be accessible from within this function. So you have private members of an object. What you could also do, just to show a different version of the syntax, if you have the same property name, same object name, is that the return statement part, uh, because some people program APIs and similar, that in the return statement, you only want to have the names of something that you expose. Basically, it's just easier to read. So if we have here the title equals uh, title colon title and directed by band colon, uh, the one behind the colon could be any name of the function declared above with the var keyword. It's just to make it easier. And also, with we were talking about the prototype inheritance and, and also people coming from more classical languages. Um, inheritance is good, but inheritance is also, also something that people seem to get fixated with. And, and then you start inheriting things in, in 10 different lines and you get performance problems and, and similar. So I just want to bring up the concept of namespacing in JavaScript. And, and namespacing could pretty much mean anything. So. What I'm talking about here is, well, first you want to avoid global variables because they're evil. That's one of the things all these days to other developers to make sure you're on the same page. It was also about code structure and, and about extending code without having an, an actual inheritance relationship. So if we have just a regular object here, we have a ban object, and on the ban object we call something ban.director. And as you saw before, I'm using the module pattern just to create something with a private member and then a public method that you can call. So the movies method here, you can call it band.director.movies. And say you have another object here, the band.actor object. Um, it can have all its own methods and variables and members and all that. But if you want to, you can also utilize what the band.director object offers. So we were talking about using the call method before to call something in a certain context. So what we do here is that we call the .movies method of the director object, but within the context of the band.actor object. I should also say that the top part here is, is usually a little thing just in JavaScript that if you try to do something like band.actor, uh, and the ban object doesn't exist, you will get an error. So it's just about creating an empty object to avoid that. <clears throat> and when it comes to programming, we also want to use all these, uh, well, different terms like sugaring and, and currying, which implies that there's something really cool going on. And sugaring is something that I covered before. It's basically that you kind of sprinkle some sugar on the existing objects and make them a little better. So string here is the native JavaScript string object. You use prototype on that and you add your own trim method because it doesn't exist one. And then it will just replace all the, well, empty spaces in the beginning or at the end of that value and return that value. That's sugaring, you know, pretty easy, pretty nice, pretty useful for some cases. And then, th this is probably, I usually have it here just to mess with your minds because I will present this and you will wonder what the hell happened and then I will move on. So, for you to read the code later on as well. But if we start with the regular function here, we have the add function and it utilizes the arguments collection as you said before. So it basically takes any kind of argument in iterates over that, adds them together, and returns the sum. Okay? So then we bring Crockford into the picture again. I actually tried to write a better version, and I failed, so I used his version here. And what it does is we have the core JavaScript object, the function object here, and you extend it through prototype with a method called curry. And then a lot of weird shit goes on here that will, in, in essence, create magic. And just to bring up some of the lines here, the, the first one here is a bit funky. And we have the variable slice that equals array.prototype.slice. What I do here is that I'm actually 
stealing the slice method from the array object but without having an actual array. I can just pick the cherries I want from an object and put them on my objects or call them within my context if I want to. So what I do is, after I've stolen the slice method from the array object, is that I call that slice object with the apply method that we had before to call it within a certain context. And I call it with the arguments, i.e. all the params that were sent into that function. So that's a lot of weird code. What it actually means and, and why it's being done is, you remember I said before that arguments is a collection and not an array. And the thing is I want to use array methods on it so that's why I use the slice method because the result of the slice method will return an array. I know. But it goes on. Uh, we have the disk keyword and the disk keyword is, is reserved and it's about the context when it's being called. Uh, and also with inner functions, having access to outer functions. Just save it in a uh, variable called that instead. So what happens every time that we call this function further on is that we remember the value of args, which is just the arguments as an array. So I can use the concat method on it and just use slice again for the new arguments that get sent in. So I can just send them all together or add them all up. And you know, this just seems, well, annoying and you know should I really know this and, and where it becomes powerful is that it's a bit about metaprogramming in JavaScript just remembering the result of some action and then keep on working from that result so instead of starting from scratch all the time. So what we do here is that we have just like before when we were adding up numbers that the first time we call the current method with any number of arguments we want it will remember the result of that, or sorry, actually the, the value of all those parameters. And then when we call that again with another one, it actually means we can have two functions called with any number of arguments and it will just pack it all together and give you the result of that. So this is nice. And if you code HTML or CSS or something, you have validators and, and you can point out your own flaws or other people's flaws if you want to because it says so in the specification. It has to be a certain way. It's not really the same way in JavaScript. It's, it's more about best practices. What works, what won't crash over time, what, what seems to be the most solid approach. And I mentioned before with JSLint. JSLint is a tool just to check your JavaScript syntax. Uh, and it checks for small things, like if you've forgotten a semicolon or similar, uh, but it also checks for regular problems when will people omit the curly brace or something, so the code will run, but it will not run as some people expect. So I strongly recommend trying that tool on your code and just see the feedback. And I, I guess also my message today, because I'm, I'm the boring guy, I'm just presenting JavaScript, how it actually works. I'm not showing funky demos or videos or people moving iPods or telling about how much sex sells. I'm just talking about JavaScript. But what I wanted you to take with you is JavaScript is something else. It's not C or Java or, or any of those languages. And, and don't really try to make it into that as well. I mean, it's like, in your private life, if you, if you move on from a relationship to a new relationship, I mean, you can have them dye their hair and dress up as a nurse, but it's not the same person. So kind of drop it, accept JavaScript, and, and, and learn to love it instead. And uh, that's how we JavaScripters roll. Thank you. <laughs>